now we're going to get started on the inside of this monitor. Again, we're working on the Sony PVM 20L5, and the first thing we need to do when we work inside the monitor is get the shell off. That way we can get inside of the circuit boards and the other important uh, areas of the monitor that we're going to be servicing and adjusting. Now, when you originally look at the side of this monitor, you'll notice there are some extra screws that will not be removed to get the shell off. What we're going to remove to get the shell off on this is the three screws on the larger piece of metal on each side. And then there are four screws in the back of the PVM on the plastic that are holding that black, or they, the screws are black, but they're holding that uh, board and the other things on the back in place. You don't have to take off these uh, plate guards or you really don't even have to remove your boards if you're careful enough. Uh, but once you get those screws out, you should just be able to get behind the monitor and slip the shell off, slowly pulling it back towards you, just like any other PVM. It's pretty pretty standard right there. So that's how you get it open. And uh, one of the first things to notice on this PVM is how compact it is. Now, this is the first time I've opened this one. Uh, maybe not the very first time, but it's definitely the first time I've opened it to be serviced. I might have just opened it to check and make sure there wasn't anything damaged initially, but it still had cobwebs and uh, some a large amount of dust built up in it. And again, this one was sold new to a local video uh, editor who rarely used it and then put it in storage and then I got it from him. So never been serviced inside. It's never really needed servicing to this point. So uh, it's just a really, uh, you know, it's in good shape, but still pretty dirty inside and needs some cleaning. You can really see some uh, cobwebs down here uh, in this clump of wires over here to the just under the yoke assembly and right above that heat sink plate. So just uh, a lot of things actually inside this monitor. This is one of the most compact and cramped 20 inch PVMs uh, or really probably altogether broadcast level monitors you work on. See when you work on like a 20 inch BVM, you're going to have a lot more room in there. There's a lot bigger. So this one's really cramped. There's a lot of boards hanging on top of each other, a lot of wires connecting the boards together. And the first board we're working on is going to be this board over on the right-hand side of the monitor. If you're looking at the back of it, it's got a ton of capacitors in it and a couple connection points. There are some screws holding it onto this hub, you know, this plastic here. So just make sure that you don't torque those screws too hard. You could crack that plastic. Again, all the plastic in this PVM tends to be pretty uh, brittle. So it's still workable, but it's very brittle. So you have to be very careful when you're working it. So this is the board we're working on first. Um, again, this cap kit I got came directly. Look, this one came directly from Save on Pat. At least the plan for it did. Now... I did replace a couple of different capacitors with the higher quality capacitors that I use, but the kit design was from him, and uh, so that's where I got the actual layout for it, plus his recommendations for upgrade kit parts. So this kit is available on... Um, it's available on eBay, and it might be something to, you know, definitely use if you have any troubles with your PVM, but it's kind of an odd kit, and I'll talk a, talk a little bit more about that as we go through this repair, some of the odds and weirder things that are on it. But this board was like a mini version of a power supply unit. It looked to have a lot of the power supply parts on it, so maybe that's even you know what its ultimate design is, is to be like a breakout board for the power. But this one, uh, pretty easy to recap. The caps were uh, in there, and you know the, the thing that Sony did do was they used extremely high quality capacitors, uh, especially on these 20L5s. So that's why if you you know get in there and you look at the capacitors, you'll notice a lot of them are metal topped, and I mean they're really really high end versions of capacitors. So a lot of times 
um, even nowadays, if they're not, if the monitor doesn't have a lot of use, a lot of these capacitors will still be good. So these are the removed spots on the board where the capacitors go. And now I'm going to go in and heat up my iron, and then we're going to replace the capacitors in here that um, are recommended by the Save on Pat cap kit. Now, if you're really serious about you know getting in here um, and replacing every capacitor in your PVM, just note that this one will be a colossal task, and it's definitely something I would not recommend for anybody who's on any kind of like a novice level. Um, I'll give you my thoughts towards the end of this more on that, on how difficult it was for this particular uh, cap kit and to actually go in and replace all the caps on this particular PVM and do serious repairs. It's really difficult. There's there's a lot of um, you know, the size on this. Everything's compacted down smaller. Uh, the components are practically right on top of each other. There's very little room to get in and out in between things. And this was actually one of the boards that was easier to work around. The later boards, I'm just going to show them to you. They were actually really difficult to get in and work on. But the cap kit, you know, it's pretty simple. I'm showing you how I like to replace caps where I'd remove them all first and then I come in afterwards and, um, and then sometimes I'll tack them into place, uh, usually with flux and some uh, nice solder. And then after I tack them into place and snip the legs down, I come over it and I reflow the solder to make sure the connection is nice. And then we'll, of course, clean these uh, areas up with some alcohol after all this, but I wanted to show you the majority of the capacitor replacement on this board since it was easier to work around and since primarily the other boards were really just too compacted and too uh, difficult to work around and get a lot of good footage to work in. So uh, this was really the best board to do all this, but it's always good. You see what I'm doing in here? I, I actually had one of the capacitors I put in was the wrong value. I put the wrong cap in one of the places right there, and I caught myself after I did a quick check after what I'd done and uh, found that cap. So even, you know, to make sure you're paying extra close attention and don't accidentally do that and then not catch it, and then you'll have a big problem if you turn the monitor on or put it back together with possibly the wrong capacitor in one of the uh, places that you replaced it. So it's always a great idea to go in and double and triple check the capacitor changes. You know, make sure that they're all pointed, um, the negative side is on the right negative position, and then everything else is uh, in the right spots. So that's that one board. And with it out of the way, we're going to work on getting the next board out, which ultimately is going to be the neck board and the chassis. And uh, the chassis is obviously behind this video input card here with all our different inputs, the master input board that is uh, attached to the PVM. So that board doesn't actually have any, um, that doesn't actually have any, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, parts in it that we're going to be working on. Now, this is the discharge method. I wanted everybody to see that warning. Do not try this discharge method at home, okay? This is the Sony recommended discharge method, and I only did this uh, sometimes when the monitor is in really good condition. I can inspect that anode cap and cable, but this is how you're supposed to discharge it according to Sony's manual, which just means working it around till you actually get it un hit, unhooked uh, from the back of the CRT tube there, you get it unclipped, and then after you finally get it unclipped, make sure you don't touch any of that metal, but you tap that metal part to the main chassis really anywhere. I did the uh, grounding plate on the back of the CRT, and that's all you do. Now, I'm not going to go up next to that tube spot, so I'm not actually going to, uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't be going near it, but you should discharge that too with a discharge tool after you've done what I just did. The reason behind doing it in that method that I just showed you is you're not going to damage the back of the tube by scraping it with the uh, screwdriver or anything. That would, apparently was a problem back in the day where two techs that were uh, untrained would often go in and scrape that tube too hard and actually damage it. 
So that's something uh, to take you know, into consideration. Next, when you're removing the neck board, you notice there was a piece of plastic that tends to hold this neck board into place. That is going to be so brittle that uh, from the heat of being on the CRT gun, it's going to most likely shatter. Mine just shatters into pieces just by pretty much touching it. Don't worry about that. You can get some silicone and reapply that. Or if you're not moving the monitor, it's, it'll still sit nice and snug on the neck board without that piece of plastic holding it. But that's where the plastic went. And the next thing I'm doing is I'm actually uh, disconnecting this uh, portion of the uh, plastic where there's two cables that come in from the back of the flyback. Uh, those cables come into the neck board, and you can see how that's got a weird... Uh, proprietary grip or uh, plastic connector on there. So that way you can get it out of the way and have no uh, nothing connected to it at all while you're going through and um, working on that neck board. You can have it isolated by itself, which is definitely needed. Now, I'm trying to get the chassis out, and that cannot be done uh, without removing this board right above my head where you normally have your cards, your additional cards. It's just a couple screws that hold the whole plastic housing in place. And then you can kind of just lift it and set it out to the side. And then there are two screws on the chassis. One is usually behind the flyback. So make sure you get that one. And there's one right at the back here where this little white piece of plastic is under my hand. And that's all that's holding it in there. So make sure you just get that out and get all the cables out of the way as best as possible because I've been mean, looking at that. That is a ton of cabling, probably twice as much as like a 20M2 or I mean an M series or like a, you know, another medical monitor. It's probably got twice as much cabling inside it. So again, very small. The, and the neck board looks pretty standard, but the chassis is very small. Now, here's one of the parts in the kit. And um, this kind of confused me, okay? That one of the parts in the kit was this uh, attached to this heat sink this IC right here, and um, and I checked the parts numbers on it, and it was exactly the same, and for some reason, Pat only recommended changing the first one. Now, there's one of these for each color, right? So there's one, two, three. So there's going to be three of these total. The problem is, is those heat sinks are so close together, I have no idea how anybody would be able to change the other two if you had an issue with the other two uh, back ones. If one of those burn out, I don't know how you change them without taking the whole board apart practically and, and actually removing the heat sinks most likely to get to the other part. And um, since the parts were exactly the same, you know, take caution and don't you don't actually have to change them if you don't want to, if there's not an issue with these parts, because again, the part number is exactly the same. And the second reason I say this, as I look on the back of this board, and this was not clear in the instructions for the cap kit, but there's actually a little diode, I believe, attached on the bottom of each one of these ICs. Every single one of them has it uh, jumpered over into the same spot with some silicone on there. So that really wasn't clear either. And again, I don't really see the point to changing this part, particularly here, just this single one when it has three of them on the board. And again, it's not an upgrade part particularly there because it was the same exact part numbers on the front of that, uh, that board description right there. So just note that there are some parts recommended, two parts recommended change on that, and, and they're pretty much a similar just like that. Um, so that's what you get in that kit. And if you go look at the kit some more, you're going to get in here, and it's just got sporadic capacitors that are listed to replace in here and that's fine but you have again this is so difficult to get in and work around here just because of all the metal shielding and um, the actual design of how tightly close and all the heat sinks i mean they pretty much cover up nearly every single uh, capacitor it's just like there's extra heat sinks over top of them Things are compacted all together. Look at this cluster of capacitors up here on the other side of this. You've also got uh, other components attached to the outside of this large uh, shielding to dissipate more heat. So it's really a difficult design. And, uh, you know, the only way I'd really, I'd only recommend this kind of stuff, again, for really extremely highly, uh, um, you know, level of, expertise and experience 
with uh, electronics repair to get in here and do this. One of the other things was that. That's another little part that was included in the, ki in the kit. And I was trying to figure out why. It's this one right here, this three-pronged uh, IC. And again, same exact part number as the replacement part. I didn't see a single difference on the replacement part. It's not as if it was a better part. My guess is this board, this board sits... Uh, or this part of the heat sink sits on an exterior part where there's some ground cables that come across and other cabling that comes through here. And you may get an opportunity to have a short between these legs, and then you'll probably blow out this part. And that's most likely what I think would be the reason this was in the kit. In case that happens, maybe more often than not, this part fails. So if you have an issue with your PVM, that might be one of the parts to look at. Uh, replacing and that was actually an easier part that was on the outside of the board one of the easier parts out of all of them but when you get that kit you also need to know that you're not just getting uh, the parts you have to actually go in and buy some more uh, heat, thermal paste some nice you know thermal paste to put in between those components if you do change them you need to put that between that and the heat sink you get a little bit of that on there um, which I didn't show any of that I just showed the single board being done, but now I've got everything put back together, and it's, again, a long and tedious process that I just didn't show you all the way through it. It was the exact opposite of putting it or taking it apart, just putting it all back together, making sure every one of those cables is connected, and there were dozens of connections on this monitor, and then we're going to go ahead now and do a uh, firing up of the monitor or test run, and we'll see just initially whether we can get power into it what happens when we turn it on what the screen looks like and this is like one of those you know the nerve-wracking moment we have to finish the repair something that technically you know difficult and um, that precise of a machine it always makes you nervous when you put it back together and you're actually getting to turn it back on but thankfully everything um, worked out okay and everything looks fine on here uh, so everything worked that's that's really good i just wanted to go through and show you the menu pulls up this is the very this is honestly the very first time i did pull it and turn it on so i didn't uh i noticed i didn't have any edit cuts or in there that was this is the first time after the capacitor replacement so just at this point we're going to go in and work on running a lot of tests and that's going to be testing every input for um, analog video as well as some of the digital input video inputs and then we'll test the video card slot and uh, just get a good overall idea of what condition we're in but that's going to all wait till the next video because uh, that's going to do it for today's episode today's episode was pretty much just about the chassis and the inside of the monitor and getting in there and working around, giving you guys a good idea of what it looks like inside there. But again, this is not repair stuff that I'd recommend for people who are not highly uh, trained and do not have you know a lot of experience working on uh, specifically you know monitors like this. You know if you don't if you don't uh, if you get inside there and um, you're afraid to work on those boards, then it's probably a good idea to try to find somebody else that will do it for you. Because again, this monitor is becoming so rare. And the fact that it does uh, 480p and 720p and 1080i and 240p, it does all those. And it uh, just accepts so many great video inputs that it's still one of the most desirable broadcast CRT monitors on the market. So again, let's look for that next time. I'll have that come in in just a couple days, that episode where we go through the calibration and you get a lot of, see a lot of the testing. I've got some really cool stuff already taken care of for that. But uh, that's going to do it for this episode. Please leave a like and let me know if you have any questions or comments below. And I'll see you guys next time with some more retro content.